fairy tales or myths or attention seekers. No matter what you say, we cannot strong black woman these illnesses out of us. And all we want, all we've ever wanted, was to be seen. All right. All right. Hello, hello, and welcome all, welcome all to How We Survived Our Mental Illness. Um, sponsored by the Fierce Urgency of Now and hosted by me, Naisha D, the founder of Pure Spark. Um, today we have two beautiful and amazing um, panelists joining us. And panelists, before you um, introduce yourself, I'd love to give you, get your thoughts on this poem. Um, this poem was shared to me by a cousin of mine um, who also is dealing with some um, mental health diagnosis. Um, and I just heard it and was like, ooh, she spoke to me. Uh, so please, um, Tony, I see, I see you unmuted yourself first, but please give me some thoughts uh, about what we just listened to. I absolutely loved it. She's a very powerful speaker. And when she was saying that you can't fit all, when she can't fit all of those illnesses in this poem, you know, it just made me think about everything that we have to go through that is just unseen and like not everything can just be shown on our face so we have to hide it and push it down so it really just spoke to me on that level i kind of got a little teary-eyed a little bit yeah i thought jasmine was just a powerful speaker and just kind of addressed the way that we have are taught the value our exterior over our, our mental health and how, you know, and then also so many Black women, we come to hospitals, we come to therapists and say, you know, we're not doing well, we're suicidal. And they're like, well, you look great. What's wrong with you? And how at the end, Jasmine was just like, I just want to be seen. And I think that's just the cry that so many Black women and Black girls have. Yes, yes. Um, thank you both for, for responding to that video. And I actually just put the link to the YouTube video in the group chat. So if you um, wanna listen to it again or share it with someone, I think that would be awesome um, because I think sometimes it's hard to explain what it feels like to be in any one of those uh, categories that she listed. Um, and speaking of which, I'd love uh, for the both of you to kind of introduce yourselves um, you know, you know, the, your name, the platform that you're on using now and give us a little bit about, you know, the diagnosis that you have or you're currently living with. Um, I'll go first. My name is Antoinette Wooden. I do go by Tony a lot. Um, I am the host of Black and Bipolar podcast. Um, this is where I talk about just my journey as being a Black woman with Black and being Black and having bipolar. Um, I do manage auditory psychosis as well. So I do have two voices that I hear, um, voices sounds that I hear on a uh, daily basis that I manage with medication. And I talk about that on my podcast and how it is to manage extra voices on a day-to-day -day basis from going to a checkout line to being in a quiet library to just sleeping. Um, right now we're working on our second season. Um, you can look, listen on Apple Music, um, Spotify, sorry, we've expanded, uh, iHeartRadio, and a few other, basically any platform that you can listen to a podcast, we're there. And if we're not, please shoot me an email so I can also do that complicated process. <laughs> um, but that is all about me. Thank you, Tony. Amade? Yeah, I'm Imade, I go, go by she, her pronouns. Um, I created the nonprofit Depressed While Black. Um, it provides Black affirming personal care items to psychiatric patients. I was hospitalized twice and know what it's like to go into the hospital with fresh braids, coming out looking a hot mess and just feeling like, wow, like, so white folks get the combs they want, they get the, they get the lotion they want, they get the shampoo they want in these hospitals, but Black folks don't have these personal care items. And so I wanted to make a difference so that no one feels that sense of loneliness the way that I felt. And so I teamed up with a, a, 
a black owned uh, beauty supply uh, organization called uh, Horizon. They make all natural beauty uh, products and we hand them and give them to psychiatric patients in Burlington and Greensboro, North Carolina. And I'm also, we created a program called Help Me Find a Therapist to help folks find black therapists. And we are planning to relaunch the program in early uh, next year. And that's in partnership with uh, Darkness Rising, amazing black led nonprofit, Beam, another amazing black led nonprofit, and Miriam Kaba, who's an abolitionist and educator. Our goal is to uh, uh, support uh, 5,000 folks who are formerly incarcerated to connect them with therapists of color. Well, child, um, thank you, thank you both for both of your platforms. I really feel connected, obviously, because you know we're we're all black, right? Um, but we all are living with diagnosis. Um, and Amadi, I don't know if you mentioned your diagnosis. <laughs> Yeah, um, I live with a clinical depression, a borderline personality disorder, and thanks to the pandemic, generalized anxiety disorder. I am now on two anxiety meds. Shout out to the pandemic. So yeah. <laughs> Shout out to the pandemic. Oh, yes. And I don't know if any of the attendees today um, can relate to anything that we said, but I just want to let you know, feel free to use the chat um, to talk amongst yourselves. Uh, I did. I don't know if I formally welcomed you here, uh, but feel free to drop, you know, your name, where you're checking in from, um, anything that you want to, you know, let us know about mental health. If you're a mental health wellness professional, practitioner, whatever, you could drop it in the chat um, so that we can kind of build somewhat of a community here. I also dropped in the chat um, links to both Tony and Amadi's um, platform so you can connect with them after uh, this great discussion that we're about to have. Um, and I didn't introduce myself. Uh, my name is Naisha Deed. I am the founder of Pure Spark. Um, Pure Spark was a platform that I started back in 2018 19 on the heels of me recovering from a very, very deep depression um, that I got into in 2017 after my 15 year career in corporate accounting. Um, and I had starting, I had started to see a lot of my family members, you know, going through a lot of um, difficult times when it came to mental health and mental illness. Um, so bad, so that uh, we lost a fifth family member uh, back in 2018 to suicide. Uh, so suicide and suicide awareness and prevention is so important to me, and I'm so glad we could be here to talk about it during this month. Um, with two amazing Black women. So yes, please share anything you'd like in the chat. Uh, so let's, let's get this started. I, I want to start by trying to demystify mental illness, right? Um, because a lot of us growing up, I don't know if any of the attendees felt this way, but thought that you know, mental illness was something that happened to bad people or no way could it happen to me. Like, I'm too smart. You know, we think we can outwit <laughs> mental illness, right? Um, it's, it's for those people that live on the street or, you know, those people that are so far distant away from me that that's on the t t television, right? Um, so I want to try and demystify that a little bit. Um, and I'll start with Tony. Um, when did you first learn about your diagnosis? What were your thoughts? How did you feel? Who did, who did you tell? And probably more importantly, who didn't you tell? Um, so, you know, when did you first learn about your diagnosis? What were your thoughts? How did you feel about that? Um, and, you know, who did you tell and who did you not tell? So I first learned about my diagnosis when I was 26. Um, I had been dealing with the voices beforehand, though, since I was 15 in high school. Um, the first person I told about the voices without a diagnosis was my best friend. Um, at, and it's, I mean, as 15 year olds, you don't know what to do with that information. So you just kind of all right, this is this is where you're headed. All right, cool. Um, so when I was 26, I had told her and I explained to her and my partner at the time, I had let them know and they kind of didn't take it serious. And we both kind of didn't take it serious. We just, you know, it's no big deal. I'll be fine. I would have been managing this entire time. I'll keep managing. 
I didn't tell my parents because raised in a traditional Christian black family household, it's uh, only white people go to therapy is always what we joked about and always what they would say. So it, I, therapy wasn't even in my mind to even do. Medication wasn't in my mind to do either because that same family tradition, we didn't believe in medication for those things. We believed in medication for heart problems, diabetes, for everything else but the mind. So uh, from there growing up, I really didn't understand anything that um, my um that what I needed or that I could seek help. I it wasn't until probably at the end of my last relationship, which would have been about four years ago, when I actually started to go to therapy, but I still wasn't taking it serious. I was still kind of like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm not doing the right tools because I'm not getting any better. Like I relate, but not really. And this lady is white and she doesn't really understand like, you know, why my parents would, would be this way and everything. So um, that was an issue. But uh, from there, after in 2020, uh, I guess if we're shouting out the pandemic 2020, the pandemic hit and um, I went into a really bad spiral. I had a really bad episode where um, I was very close to being hospitalized again. And um, yeah, that's when I got serious about my therapy. I got serious about my medication and I was really tired of the up and down cycles of mania. So I was, I just kind of said, you know, I have to make a change. And it's kind of like, when you have that mania a part of you, um, it's like that addiction. It's always that high that you're looking for, like you're looking for that next up and everything. So I was kind of tired of always looking for that next up, being addicted to it. And I just want and I just want to say, you know, I need to manage this better because it's not healthy. And honestly, my bank account can't handle all of the ups I go through. So, so that's when I say, you know, I really need to change, but, um, I didn't tell my parents really until probably about the end of 2020. That's when they really knew that I had a diagnosis and, um, I really don't tell them much about it. They can listen to the podcast cause I pretty much laid it all out there. But it's still one of those subjects that I don't feel comfortable talking to my family about because we never had those conversations in house. And it's not something that we're familiar with as a family. But I have a community that I can reach out to that I do lean on when it comes to that. Not saying my parents are supportive or whatnot, it's just there's a different type of support I need from certain people, if that makes sense. Yes, it absolutely does make sense. Um, I think it's so important to have community and the community of peers that understand what it's like to be in your shoes to a certain degree. Like no one's going to walk in your shoes and know your entire life. But if you talk to someone about, um, you know, these urges to do certain things and they also choose kind of are dealing with the same illness they understand it's kind of beyond your control to a certain degree like um and and I was nodding a lot I don't think I mentioned this in the beginning um I also um was diagnosed with bipolar disorder actually in 2008 and then I was in denial I don't know if either one of you experienced that denial like what they talk about all right cool you want me to do this I'll do that I'll do that cool I feel better I feel better I am amazing how are you I'm going back and doing what I was doing before and we're just not going to tell anybody we're going to sweep this under the, underneath the rug and we're going to go on about our lives and then boom it hit me back in the face in 2017 um and I felt like I was going through my own um pandemic of sorts because I was on the depression side. That's normally when it gets bad for me. Um, and I couldn't leave the house. I felt trapped in my own body. Um, and I don't know if anyone's experienced depression, but you really feel like you're captive. You know, you're like, ah, like I can't get out of bed. I can't take a shower, all these things. Um, but Amade, I want to throw it to you and, and ask the same question just so folks can kind of understand who you are. When did you first learn about your diagnosis? What were your thoughts about your own diagnosis? Um, you know, how did you feel? And who did you tell and who didn't you tell? 
Yeah, I had an experience similar to Tony. Um, I got diagnosed with clinical depression uh, in, in 2012. And yeah, my first thought was like, this is a white person disease. Like, why do I even have this? Um, because basically, you know, my mom raised me to believe that black people are stronger than white people and that we survive slavery, we can survive anything and we don't need the support that white people have. And so in some ways it helps you cope with a lot of the structural racism you experience, but it's also difficult to identify how we are human and how this is a natural part of being a human is that you have these emotions and these feelings and these mental health challenges. And so I didn't tell my mom in the beginning um, because I knew that she would give me a checklist of, did you do this? Did you do that? And that's exactly what she did. And I timed the disclosure to my mom um, right before a therapy session, because I knew that if she triggers me and she makes me really upset, I can just collapse on a therapist's couch right after. Um, and so basically, yeah, she did that thing. She said, you know, did you pray about it? And I said, yes, you know, like, did your pastor pray about it? And then I said, yeah, like in front of the whole church, like I came up there and prayed, like what? Like to give me something else, you know? And then she, you know, she tried to like um, be compassionate. And sometimes when I think mothers try to be compassionate and they haven't really used that muscle, they don't really do it that well. And so my mom was just like, well, I guess it makes sense. Your depression, you don't have no father. You don't have no friends. You live in a little room. And I was just like, mom, this is, you're making me more depressed. <laughs> and so it just is, it was, it was kind of a trial and error. I kind of kept my mom outside of uh, mental health discussions. But the thing that the challenge that happens is for some of us who uh, experience suicidality, we're thrown into a hospital and they're asking for the next kin. And so <laughs> the challenge in those situations when you're in a crisis and the hospital staff is asking, who do we contact? What is the emergency contact? Sometimes that person, the parent that you put on ice, you they're basically flung from not knowing anything into basically the center of a disaster. And so I was hospitalized in 2015 after a suicide attempt. And the hospital staff there was just so, so terrible um, that nobody believed me. You know, so, sometimes when you have a suicide attempt or you have any type of psychosis or crisis, they don't think anything you say makes sense. They invalidate. I mean, I can say the sky is blue and they're like, are you sure? Because you just had a suicide attempt. You know, like it's just it's like that. And so I, my mom had to be the one, my mom and my best friend at the time had to basically uh, talk to all the psychiatrists, um, attended the sessions, and we tried to get, they tried to get me out of there because it was such a horrific place. And so they put my mom on the stand. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. Um, we had to go in front of a state Supreme Court judge to get out of a psychiatric hospital. And my mom had to testify about like, I can take Imade home. Imade can stay with me. She does not have to be in a place where she's afraid to go to sleep at night. She could come home with me. And she had to say that on the stand. Um, and of course, the, the judge didn't believe her. Uh, she, the judge believed the psychiatrist who said that um, if I go into my mom's car, I'll jump out of the car because I'm so mentally ill. I'm just going to jump out of the car. And so, it, at that point, it went from my mom not knowing anything to me and my mom against the world. And so she's definitely been really supportive and she's came a long way. So I would just say as an encouragement to folks who are dealing with family members that have stigma, uh, I think it's important to lead by example because they're watching you. Even if you think they're not watching you, they watch you go to therapy, they're watching you take medication, and they may be able to argue with whether you should do that, but they cannot argue with progress. They cannot argue with healing. They cannot argue with the fact that they see you thriving after you do what you need to do to take care of yourself. And some folks, they may talk about you now and they may be going to therapy later. So I just wanna encourage folks that you can impact your family and change your family. Um, I think both of us, right? Um, Tony, myself, Amade, we all have been um, in the hospital. Um, <laughs> I've been there 
four times. <laughs> uh, and I always kind of have these mixed emotions about, um, you know, the hospital because I know I have to be somewhere in order to be safe, right? And, you know, at the time I was put on medication, I was put on lithium um, and they had to get my levels right and all that stuff. So I had to be in a safe environment for that to happen. So that's one piece of it. But then the other side of it is, boy, oh boy, what a place to try and learn to heal. <laughs> <laughs> white walls, very sterile environment, people that really, you know, you're like, are you invested in my healing or what's going on here? I don't really know. Um, and so it can be a very uh, scary place, I think. Um, and, and Tony, I'm just curious to know about your experience in the hospital, um, if you'd like to share. Actually, to kind of touch on what Imade had said was um, the emergency contact, um, because I was because of what happened, I was very scared to tell my parents. I told them I didn't have an emergency contact. I just stayed there without one. Um, I didn't say anything until probably about 2020. My parents didn't know that I was in the hospital at one point. So it was uh, kind of a shock to them a little bit, but in the hospital, when I had attempted, um, they had to pump my stomach. And from there, like Amade had said, they didn't even believe that they really had to pump my stomach. Like, it's like they were questioning, like, you know, what had happened, even though it had happened. And they're the ones who did the whole procedure. So uh, from there, I had to take a series of questions, you know, like, is this the first time? Have you thought about doing this before? To the point where they wanted to release me right after they did it, but that procedure is kind of invasive. So like, you have to stay there for quite some time. Um, this was in Kansas City, Kansas, though. Um, so already, I already knew that I wasn't going to get the best care. But um, they decided to keep me there for the next 72 hours. And from there, I had hair kind of like you guys, I had hair at one point and it was, it was a really bad experience. The clothes that I was wearing, um, the clothes that they provided me with, it was really scratchy. So with that, it actually upset my voices. Um, the humming of the lights that were in my room was very upsetting um, to the point where I was having a panic attack and they didn't want to give me medicine for the panic attack. They did give me lithium but lithium only made it worse. Um, it actually distorted the voices. Um, so it was like they were loud, but I couldn't understand them. And the thing with these voices is that I've grown so accustomed to them that when they are not in the norm, normal setting, it starts to cause panic because I know that they're not there, but for whatever reason, my brain chemistry, it cannot Un, it's like it doesn't understand like these two voices are not around you so when they start to localize around rooms and when they sound distorted it genuinely scares me so at nighttime when it would happen in that room and I would ask somebody to just kind of stay by the door um I was alone so it just felt kind of it was a scary feeling it was a feeling that I would never ever want to put on anyone and anytime that it's ever suggested that I'm hospitalized or anything, I just panic and I say no. And I try to put on a brave face, that strong woman act. So but that strong black woman act. So that way they don't put me into that situation again. So that was my experience. Totally. Um, thank you both for sharing your experience, um, you know, around being in the hospital. And I know that there's a lot of work, especially that, you know, Beam and Amadi, I know you've worked with Beam Yolo around um, how do we, you know, create better institutions to heal and um, the fight continues. So, so thank you for that. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, you know, when you learned about your first diagnosis, what your thoughts were and who you told, who didn't tell. Uh, but now fast forward, I want to know what your thoughts are today about um, mental illness and or your diagnosis. Um, so I could start a little bit about, you know, how my thoughts have changed. I went from thinking, oh, you know, it's only a few amount of people that have a mental illness to believe in that we all got a little something. 
okay? Um, especially being in the pandemic and post-pandemic, I believe we are all dealing with something. Whether you know you are diagnosed or undiagnosed, you are living with something, right? Um, especially in you know uh, a country, a society that's surrounded around capitalism and productivity, and always having to be on and always producing, and not listening to your inner voice and yourself saying rest, you need a break. Um, and I think that was my breaking point. Um, because when I was working in corporate America and um, shout out to the firm that I was working for, you know, they paid very well. They compensated me very well, but boy, oh boy. I mean, I was working 80, 90 hour weeks sometimes, you know, and sacrificing my wellness, sacrificing my relationships. And some of the most important things to us as a human being are those two things, right? You know, our self-care and then our relationships. Um, and I abandoned both of those things. Um, and I see a lot of folks doing that to this day. Um, so I went from thinking that, oh, mental illness only um, affects the selected few and mental illness is around people that are lazy, that use drugs and all stuff to thinking, wow, those people that are out on the streets, <laughs> they could have had a beginning story just like mine, right? But they might have not had the community that Tony and Mari and myself had to kind of help them um, and, and guide them along on the way. Uh, so how has your thoughts around mental health, mental illness, how has it shifted since your um, first diagnosis? I, Tony, I'll let you start. So for me, um, it's shifted a lot, um, especially when I see uh, individuals uh, talking to themselves, um, mostly veterans or the homeless community or um, anyone that I see just talking to themselves um, aggressively um, because I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like when you are having an episode and I'm so sorry, my dog is in here. I have, I'm so sorry. He just opened up the door. <laughs> No um, worries. This is real life, people. This is real life, okay? Um, <laughs> so, um, oh gosh. So, like I was saying, so I know what it feels like to to talk back to the voices, even though they're not there. Um, I I do it. I wouldn't say often because I'm working on not totally acknowledging every negative thing that they say to me. Um, but I know when you get frustrated um, and they're loud and you're having a frustrating day, I know what it's like to yell at them or to talk to them because you feel alone or you're sad and you just start either agreeing with them or, you know, those things. When I was in high school, um, you know, before the first voice, I would see people talking on the street and like, oh man, they're crazy. Like, who are they even talking to? You know, you had all these like negative thoughts because, you know, you knew no better. I knew no better during that time. Even though we, I was taught to respect everyone, you still have these very biased thoughts that still pop into your head. Um, as I got older and I started noticing, like, you know, they're talking to themselves, but like they have the same tics that I have. They're, they're you know, they're doing the same behavior I do. I think they're experiencing what I'm experiencing. And then as I got diagnosed and now that I'm like way older and of course I understand a little bit more, you know, it makes me sad because, you know, our, the way that our system works, it doesn't work to in the benefit of people who are marginalized. It doesn't work in their benefit at all because, you know, just a simple pill helps me manage these two voices. It helps me being able to, um, understand, you know, like what is real, what is not real. It helps to control these hallucinations, but you know, these pills aren't cheap. You know, my pills cost about 1500 a month and that's without insurance. So I can't imagine what it's like when I, you don't have work or you don't have that income. And then this is not just like, you know, free income that I have, you know, I have to work so many hours just to be able to afford my medication. That's crazy. So 
it's those type of things that I have grown to know about my diagnosis and knowing exactly what resources to go to and look for um, is one of the many things that I share in my podcast, because I think people think that because I'm a high functioning person, that it's just easy to manage when it's really not. I have to put in a lot of work to be able to hear people that are in front of me and also listen and trying to tune out two other voices on top of that. Um, sometimes I stutter a little bit because like I'm, I'm focusing on what the person's saying, but then I'm hearing two other things. So those are the things that I try to take in consideration, especially when people are, they're not like, I don't know, it's just different now that, you know, I've gone through the emotions and I've gone through everything that I can experience um, so far. So right now I've been going through a grieving experience and that has been a, uh, a challenge in itself and what these voices have been saying, what type of nightmares I've been having. So with the diagnosis, it's definitely changed my perspective on a lot of things. Understood. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I see some folks are asking about resources, and that's actually the next question that we're going to ask. But uh, before we get to that question, Amade, um, what are your current thoughts about mental illness um, and or your diagnosis? Yeah, uh, I was first diagnosed with clinical depression and experienced a lot of mental health professionals freaking out about my uh, chronic suicide ideation. Um, and so what they did was they put me on a lot of antidepressants. Um, but I didn't know at the time antidepressants can actually increase suicide ideation. And so in some ways, I felt like I spent years poisoning myself in some ways. Uh, and, and, and it's hard. Um, it's hard to think about that I spent like eight years of navigating therapy until I got the right diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, which is essentially just having super intense emotion, um, being afraid or triggered by perceived or real uh, rejection or abandonment, um, having big emotion mood swings. Um, and so I went through all of that and and kind of came on the other side of it with the right diagnosis that saved my life. I had to fight for the diagnosis. I was told by a therapist that we just treat the symptoms, not the, the condition. And so I had to drop the therapist <laughs> because I, it, it's kind of like borderline is kind of like bipolar in the sense of like you actually do have to treat the condition. You cannot just treat one little symptom over here, over there. You have to treat the whole thing. Um, and so I had to find a therapist who saw me, who saw my condition and knew how to treat it with DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, so I would just say what I've learned is that, you know, I'm worth fighting for. Um, I learned how to advocate for myself. I learned how to communicate my needs to uh, bosses. I learned how to communicate my needs to therapists and we have to say, you know, and psychiatrists as well, this, this, this medication is not working. Um, and what I'm learning through the process is that even though a lot of the hospitals and mental health professionals, they kind of went into this kind of emergency, lock her down, don't let her out mentality and approach to my suicidality. Um, but for me, I feel like I, I benefit from freedom. I, I benefit from um, having a choice and being, being given agency. Um, I think people underestimate how much mental illness can take our agency away from us and how it can actually be very triggering to be uh, deprived of the ability to wear clothes, <laughs> uh, deprived of the ability to touch grass, to just walk on grass. A lot of hospitals, they won't let you outside. And those things, those kind of emergency, uh, super, super uh, restrictive measures actually made my suicidality worse. And so I'm kind of learning like how cheap it is to actually treat suicidality. Like it's actually kind of cheap. You just rest, you know, for a lot of how I do it, just I rest. Um, I tell my boss I can't work. I go outside. I exercise, which I know really sucks. I wish that there was something even easier to do to help with our mental health than exercise. But yeah, I've learned that, you know, it really is a, an ease and a peace and a freedom in the way that we treat uh, our chronic suicidality. It's not um, policing it, you know? Yeah, I, I thank you both. Um, and I think, you know, 
one of the things about these mental health institutions is that it feels very punitive. Like I did something wrong, you know, something about me is wrong and I deserve to be punished because I'm depressed. I deserve to be punished because I'm suicidal. I deserve to be punished because I hear voices. And it's like, what? That's going to make it worse. Like we, we got to change the way we think about healing um, in, in our community, um, especially because we have been through so much trauma, just, you know, walking around in these black bodies um, that we have to we have to shift the way we think about um, healing in our communities and I, I just wanted to share a small thing because we, we talked a, a little bit about different things around um, medication management and therapy and um, um, natural ways of healing and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the things that I do um, in order to work on my healing and I know we're going to get to that in a second with the both of you but um, I actually started doing Chinese medicine. Um, it's the, the teacher that I am studying under because apparently he thinks that I'm going to be a healer doing this work. I don't know. I'm like, sir, I just want to learn it for me right now. He's like, that's where all healers begin, Naisha. And I'm like, really? Oh, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so he's a black man from the South, um, you know, used to be a lawyer. Um, so both of us kind of had this you know, uh, career where it was very like strict and, you know, going by the rules and, and then kind of went into this totally different career path around healing and got his PhD in Chinese medicine. And, um, I've been doing some really powerful things around, um, Tai Chi and Qigong, um, around different herbs, um, and changing my diet and also connecting to nature. And, um, this stuff is really powerful. Like I, I'm not even a year in, but I can tell you that I've, I've seen some drastic changes. So once everything is said and done and I've gotten to a certain point, I can't wait to come back and like share everything with you all um, around my re recovery. Uh, but, you know, I always like to kind of experience things with myself and then share it with people, but it's, it's powerful, it's powerful. Um, so I know we have about 15 minutes left and I want to get to the juicy stuff. You know, we set the ground about, you know, who we are, what we've been through. Um, and now I want to get to, I know we talked a little bit about some tools, um, but if there are any articles that you've read or written, <clears throat> any books, um, anything that has been helpful for you along your journey, I'd love for you to, to share it with, with folks. And um, Amade, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, any books that you've read, any articles that you've read or written, um, any self-care hacks that you have for folks, um, you know, coming from your own experience that helped you that you might want to share with everyone? Uh, yeah, um, my journey was reading a Willow Weep for me. This was at a time when like there really wasn't a whole lot of literature or conversation online about Black women dealing with depression and mental health conditions, but Willow Weep, Weep for me, I think her, uh, her name is Mary Amqua. I'm, a I'm, I'm not getting it correctly, but it's Willow Weep for me. And it's basically a memoir of a Black woman dealing with depression while raising a child. And it was just like a game changer for me. Um, but then also Basie made, put out a really great um, book. Um, I think I want to say, I'm telling you the truth, but I'm lying, I think is the name of the book. And it's, I think that's also a game changer. Memoir is just kind of are powerful for me because you use an I statement. You say, I went through this, I experienced this. And it just kind of speaks to me in a deep way. Um, but you, did you say something, some, another question about um, what has helped me? Yeah. So yeah. Um, was there anything along on your journey that you're like, man, I wish I knew about this earlier. So some of it was um, the therapy and changing the yes. therapist, right? Um, and you talked a little bit about um, setting boundaries, which I think obviously isn't something tangible that you can hold. Yeah. But boy, is it powerful. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned Willow Weep for me, and then you also mentioned um, another great book. Uh, yeah. But was there anything else that you're like, man, this really shifted, shifted my healing and, you know, got me on the right path? 
Yeah, um, I learned that actually just through my experiences that actually suicidality is rooted in anxiety and not depression. And that was a game changer for me uh, because none of the, the antidepressants work for me. And I was really frustrated. And then I realized I have a, a BPD, which there's no medication really for that condition. Um, and so I started to really understand that my suicidality is a fear that I can't take or handle the most um, the intense emotions that I experience. And then I freak out and I, and I think that I'm not gonna be able to get through it. And then what I started to realize was that's actually anxiety. That's almost kind of like a panic attack. Like you're just, you're having sensory overload. There's just too much going on. And so I just started on anxiety medication and it's definitely like a game changer for me. My brain is like a lot quieter. And, and, and when I do, I mean, I, I deal with chronic suicidal ideation, but when I do get the, the suicidal thoughts, I can take a medication and make my brain quieter so that I don't have those intrusive thoughts just back to back to back. So I would just say for folks, I encourage folks, if, if you feel like you're taking cl a class of medications that are just not working, you may have to think outside of your condition and outside of the medication class that you're taking. And I would just, I encourage people to, to advocate for themselves. A lot of times what I say is we have the right to fail. We have the right to experiment and try again. And what I tell folks all the time, psychiatrists fail all the time. They constantly give us medication that don't work. So why can't we propose something? Even if it doesn't work, we're the same level as a psychiatrist. In some ways, they make mistakes too. And I think there's this, in the, in the mental health community, there's this notion that like, if I advocate for myself and this guest that I have isn't true, I don't have the right to advocate for myself again. And as we see, psychiatrists don't quit their jobs the moment one medication they prescribe doesn't work. They're, they go, they try again. It's like that trial and error. And I think that we deserve that same grace and that same forgiveness as we advocate for ourselves. I heard that. We got to speak up for ourselves, right? Um, and, you know, I think we saw it a lot with like our physicians, especially as, as Black folks going to the doctors and saying, oh, I got a pain in this and I got, oh, just take some Tylenol, you're fine. And then five months later, it's like they did surgery and left something in you. And what? It's like, come on. So if you feel like something's not going right, I love that, Amade. Like, speak up for yourself, advocate for yourself. A lot of times, um, we give people dominion over us because of their title and, you know, of the amount of schooling that they had. But I'm a firm believer that no one knows you better than you. You have lived in this body for however long you've been on earth. The doctor only sees you for 15 minutes or 30 minutes once a year, right? Like in comparison, right? Um, uh, so Tony, over to you. I just wanted to, to, to ask you, was there anything that has drastically helped you along on your journey? Any tools, um, any resources, any hacks, books, articles? Um, I really enjoy doing this because we can share our experiences and know that our experiences weren't in vain. We can help someone else um, along on their, their healing journey. Um, so Tony, any, anything that you'd like to share? Any tools or books or hacks? Yeah, so um, tools that I've been using, I'll start with recently, I've been reading a lot of uh, poems. Um, so right now I'm reading a book, uh, Black Girl Call Home by Jasmine Manns. Um, and it's just a series of poems um, where it's just experiences that I've had um, that I can relate to that I it just seems like every Black woman or um, Black women has experienced at one time, um, just from talking to their mom, to talking to their grandma, talking to elders, not talking back, because talking back is disrespectful, even if it's just an opinion. Um, I just read a poem about that the other day, and it's really calmed me down, um, knowing that, you know, I, I'm not the only one that has actually uh, been through this. Um, for myself, what has really helped me is sharing um, sharing my experiences, you know, talking about it with people, um, which is one of the main reasons why I started the podcast is so that way people know that they're not alone in this 
and this journey that they may be going through. Because in high school, it was very scary for me to go through this entire experience, just knowing that my 15 year old best friend knows and I know and nobody else knows and trying to deal with all of this and not even actually knowing where to start. So, I mean, for me, it was just no, for me now, I wish that I would have told more people that I trusted back then. I wish that, you know, I would have been able to reach out with the right source uh, resources. Now that I'm older, um, I'm able to look up sources around uh, Columbus, Ohio, and trying to find ways that I can improve on um, managing this. You know, peer groups really help. Um, individual one-on-one. There's actually a, a social worker that is in Ohio who sets up these 30-minute to one-hour vent sessions, and you just vent you just vent everything to her. And I absolutely love it because it's not therapy. It's just me venting everything to an unbiased party. And then after that, we're done. I give her her payment and we're done. <laughs> so that has actually helped me a lot because um, sometimes I just need to vent. Sometimes I don't need anybody to tell me anything else. I just need to vent realize what was on my chest and go from there. I've been using a lot of I am statements. Um, so instead of saying like, I am broke or I am because like with money and medication bills, like it's been very stressful for me. Um, so it's like, I've been really trying to use more words that are shifted around, around it, just transitioning. So, you know, I am receiving money, yada, yada, you know, going from there. So I've been trying to use a lot more positive words instead of it's not for me, it's not toxic positivity because all I hear is negativeness from my two voices. So when I say these positive words, it's not as I'm trying to, you know, live in a false reality. I do it because all I hear is negative words being said to me on a daily basis. So when I replace it with positive words, it doesn't give them power and it makes for my day a lot more controllable. So that's what I've been doing. Um, before diagnosis, I really tried to uh, yoga, <laughs> yoga my way out of it. So <laughs> that did not work for me, but I uh, did really enjoy the core strength that I had during that time. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so that's that's where I'm at right now. Absolutely, and you know, uh, between the both of you, there's such a there's so many different tools that you mentioned, different resources, different books, and different things that you do on a daily basis. And one of the things that I try to promote is saying that everything isn't for everybody, you know. And just because something doesn't work for you doesn't mean that you're broken or you're stupid or anything like that. It's just a matter of finding your jam, you know, whatever your jam is. And I, I totally, Tony, when you said venting, I was like, that is my jam. I have one person, God bless them, that I feel like when something's happened and something's come up for me, I'm like, oh, let me call AJ because boy, oh boy, I got to get this off my chest, you know? And thank God he's just a person that can kind of listen without judgment and kind of be like a reflector and be like, oh, so how'd that make you feel? Da, da, da. I'm like, you know what? You should be a therapist because you're really good at this. And I'm just gonna, you know, you know, thank you for being my friend. Uh, but if I had to put two things in a box and say, okay, um, break when necessary. Like if you are in distress, my go-to things are um, venting, you know, like talking and Cause I'm not really a writer. I know Amade, you're a writer. You're an awesome writer. And um, Tony, I don't know if you write a lot, but I'm not a writer. I am a talker. I love to talk, talk, talk. If you can't tell, that's why I'm hosting this event. Cause I like to talk. Um, <laughs> but you know, I need to get it out vocally. Um, so if I can just vent, that's huge for me. And then also being out in nature. Uh, so if you follow me on social media, you're my friend. Um, you'll see me out in nature a lot. Tony, shake your head. He's just, we are friends on Facebook and she's probably seen me doing a lot of things outside. Not as much as I used to, but you know, um, I try and go for walks every morning. Um, and I found that that helps me to clear my head. Um, so, oh, great. Linnell, you just purchased the books. All of them? Which ones did you purchase? 
that's great. I'm glad. I'm glad you found uh, something that might be useful. Oh, I'm telling the truth. I'm, oh, yes. I'm telling the truth, but I'm lying. All right. So we have, um, you know, a couple of minutes left. And I wanted to, uh, I don't know. I see there are two questions in the queue right now in the Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, you can drop them in there. Uh, but Michelle asks, this is a great question, how can someone support a friend who has been diagnosed with depression, but who is struggle, uh, who, but who is struggled with not getting help? Sadly, uh, the not getting help to me is synonymous. Oh, I'm sorry, is is a symptom of the illness. Hmm. So, uh, Michelle, is this person trying to get help and they can't like find a therapist? Um, you know, I'm not sure, but I think a lot of us have been on the receiving end of people, um, you know, giving us help. And I think there are some people that are more helpful than others, right? Um, and I think for me, uh, the best things that my friends did during my bout with depression was to be consistent and consistently show up, whether that was through texting, calling, and they were so compassionate, you know? They said, Naisha, like, they knew me kind of before the depression had blown up, and they said, we know this is not like you, you know, we, we want you to get better, but also take your time, you know what I'm saying? Do what you gotta do. Um, we're here for you, we love you, and um, I had my sister who kept telling me, like, you'll get through this. Even though I felt like I was going to be in it for forever, um, she said, it's okay. You'll get through this. You'll get through this. Um, so that reaffirming and having people love on me when I couldn't love myself um, in a non-judgmental way, in a very compassionate way, was extremely helpful. Um, and just like spending time with me and also not dealing with me with like white glove service. Does that make any sense? Like, oh, you know, is it like, you know, and it's like, just treat me kind of like everybody else. I know it's hard, but like, I don't want like this special treatment too much because then I feel kind of like, I don't know, Amade, help me out with the word, Tony. I don't know what the word is, but I just did not like it. Don't treat me like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I call it being put at the being put at the kids' table, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, totally right. Like we we still want to have um, be treated with some level of respect, but also the awareness of like, okay, my friend's not feeling well. Let me see how I can show up. What can I do for you? Um, I'm I i do not know Tony and Mata. You can both unmute yourselves and and share like whatever um, you thought was helpful when you know, dealing with friends that are trying to help you during a depressive state or a crisis or whatever? Uh, for myself, oh, Amada, did you want to go first? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, for myself, it, I didn't tell anyone that I was depressed, so I hit that very well. Um, so I really can't say anything about that because my friends would help if I had told them but you know being embarrassed and trying not to feel like I'm so I felt needy um and then I felt like ashamed so I didn't want to tell anybody about it so I they would just see me when I was in my manic stage so they always saw like me happy and just you know like risk taker and so much confidence and everything um, but recently, my best friend had went through a very depressive um, stage. And for me, what I wanted is what I showed her with giving her space, but also letting her know I was there. Um, she hadn't left the house in a few weeks. Um, so I was concerned. And, you know, I was reaching out. I was reaching out. And sorry about that. And, um, I would text her daily, you know, just saying like little things like thinking about you. Hey, do you want something? Can I pick up something for you? Can I send something to you? Because I was out of state. Um, so I wasn't able to actually physically go over there. Otherwise, I just would have been over there. But, you know, I could send DoorDash. I could send Uber Eats if she needed something. Um, so I would send her like little um, like her favorite Starbucks drink like every every other day. 
Um, and, you know, she would text me and every time she would text me, I knew that, you know, okay, great. At least she's like seeing the messages, at least she's like alert and everything. But, you know, nothing's worse than when you know someone's going through pain and like you you want to help them, you want to take it away from them, but you also got to give them that space. And I know that for, for her, because I just known her since we were 15, I know that she needed space, but she also appreciated that I checked in on her. So um, from there, that's something that I would have wanted as well as ho someone holding space for me, but also just checking in on me. But because of the wall I put up and I put myself in this little box, I didn't receive that. So, and I know there are certain people that definitely would have given me that type of love and honored my space and everything, but I was way too much into my own ego and my own box that I didn't let people in for that, if that makes sense. Absolutely, it totally does. Amade, um, you know, how, how would you want a friend to show up for you um, when you're going through some sort of mental um, health crisis or, you know, day to day, whatever have you? Yeah, um, I had a friend uh, stop me from attempting suicide by just taking me out to dinner um, because I had a plan and because she she took me out to dinner and kind of was like, I'm going to give you food, it, it thwarted the plan. And so I just encourage folks that sometimes the smallest gestures can really save a life, um, you know, and it, sometimes you do have to factor in that the help has to be accessible. And so if you're saying, hey, you know, meet me at this restaurant 30 minutes away when a person can't, hasn't bathed in three days and has been in bed, that help isn't accessible. And so, and you don't want to set yourself up for resentment, right? Because that's what happens sometimes. Folks will offer help and then they'll get offended that you didn't receive the help, but they don't realize the help isn't accessible. And I think it's important we make help as accessible as possible, which means coming to their house, um, helping to clean up their house. Um, if, you know, helping to walk the dog, um, stuff like that offering them food kind of what Tony was saying door dashing them and stuff like that but it, it really does it's kind of it's kind of grunt work it's not glamorous um, and I think it's important to kind of accept that and to know that you don't have to be a savior like you don't have to save this person that and then most likely we don't want to be saved um, you know you just do what you can and it's important to have um, consent based help, you know, uh, help that is voluntary and that is consent-based. It's based upon them saying, yes, you can help me. And I know that it's very easy to think that because someone wants to die or because someone hears voices, you think they're wrong in other areas. But in some cases, we are perfectly clear. Just because we may not have the best grip on reality in like one area, does not mean we don't have a great grip on reality in another area. So when someone says, you know, I kind of don't want your help right now, like believe them, you know, sometimes we are crying for hours. And if you come over, it may make us embarrassed that you see us in this way. And that can make us even more depressed. And so I think it's really important to like believe what we say and trust and let us also, you know, as long as, we're safe, let us fail. Sometimes we're going to be arrogant and prideful and we're not going to let you help us. And you just got to let us fail. And but be there for us when we do come to you and realize that was stupid. We shouldn't have done that. Can I get your help? And so it's a process. It's, it can be torturous. And I think what I love about Beam and the, the Lapeace model that they uh, encourage is that when you support someone, you build in your own community care and self-care plan. So you don't create a plan to support someone without creating a support plan for yourself. I've lost friendships from not, from using someone like a therapist, thinking that they're a mental health professional and them getting burnt out because they didn't build a, a care plan and also a boundary plan for themselves. And so I highly encourage folks building a support and care plan for yourself as you care for someone else. You have to do both. If you're only doing one, you're gonna get burned out. 
you have to do both. So true, so true. I don't know how many mental health professionals we have in here, um, but that is that is real. Um, and anyone that is holding space for people, um, it's so important that we make sure that we prioritize our own wellness and we're pouring from a full cup, the overflow, right? Um, so thank you for sharing that. So I know we're a little bit past time and I wanted to kind of go through these two questions um, I'll give this next one to you, Amade, and then the following one I'll give to Tony. Um, so Amade, how are you able to afford the resources to help you? Um, I think it's Yves, um said, I had to stop because of money. So what, what tools and hacks are out there? I know, uh, for example, one regarding therapy, um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with advocating for ourselves, and asking for help is kind of saying, hey, do you do you have a sliding scale? You know, this is what I can afford. Um, can you work with me? And then I do know at one point during the um, pandemic, um, I can't think of the name of her organization, Taraji P. Henson uh, did offer and try to match people with free, like for free therapy. Um, so there are sometimes programs like that. And I'll check to see if there's any and send um, those links in the follow-up email, but um, Amade, any thoughts about how to afford some of this care? Because I know Tony had mentioned uh, medication costs him a lot. So how do we how do we do this? <laughs> it's super, it's super, super expensive. Um, I know that sometimes contacting universities um, for their therapists that are training, a lot of times it's like low cost to free. Um, and I know that you know. Training therapists sometimes get a bad reputation, but I was actually, my life was saved by a training therapist. Um, it was a Black woman about my age who understood what I went through, and I needed that level of peer, kind of peer support with her as a therapist. And so I would say sometimes maybe look into training therapists at universities in your area, um, as well as uh, reach out to your insurance. Uh, they may have in some incentives uh, when it comes to covering therapy, for me, I have Aetna, and for most of the pandemic, my therapy was free uh, because they were not charging for virtual therapy. So there may be some incentives that you may uh, don't even know that you have that you could possibly access. And yeah, definitely, like like Naisha said, sliding scale is a uh, really really a game changer. And for me, DBT, a dialectical behavioral therapy, is very expensive. It is a lot of controversy around DBT because in some ways it's repackaged uh, Asian meditation practices packaged by white people and it's super expensive. And so there's a lot of issues with DBT, um, but I uh, right now I'm taking a class that's only 20 bucks a session and it's based upon the sliding scale. And because it's everything is virtual now, I would say look throughout your whole state because you can see any therapist in your state, not just in your city, because everything is virtual now. And I would highly encourage that, that because that widens your net as well. So, yeah. Wow, thank you, Amada. You you just hit me to something new um, around checking with your universities and, and seeing if you can, um, you know, kind of be seen by a student. Um, and I almost think they're probably just a little bit more excited and like, you know, interested in, in your healing um, because they're learning uh, and they're just, I don't know, it's different when you're working with a student. So Tony, this question, ooh, child, this, this is a great question. I'm, I'm excited to pass it on to you because this is something that I struggled with when I outed myself. And I say outed myself, speaking about outing myself around my diagnosis. I was so afraid um, to share my diagnosis because of the fear of being judged, right? Like, what are people gonna think with me about me when I tell them that I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder? Like, what are they gonna think? Um, so Linnell asks, um, how do you deal with the B word, AKA bipolar disorder when interacting with people, especially when choosing a partner? I feel no one's ready to talk about BD and schizophrenia. There's fear there. How? Okay, so 
I actually have an episode on uh, black and bipolar and dating in a relationship. We have a part two coming up. So actually we talk all about this. Um, I actually, it's going to sound bad, but I actually kind of did like a, like a, I didn't want to bring it up to my partner that I had bipolar. And I definitely didn't want to bring up that on top of that, I also hear two voices and also sometimes experience hallucinations because who wants to hear that on the first date? Um, <laughs> so I actually had posted a picture of myself on my Instagram before I actually did change um, my whole Instagram to the Black and Bipolar podcast. I put a picture up and I talked about my disorder a little bit. And we had just started dating and they kind of heard about it and they saw it and they saw that I had bipolar type two, yada, yada. So we talked about it the next time we met up, which was in two weeks. And from there, um, that was it. That's all we talked about. I didn't talk about the voices. I didn't talk about any of the hallucinations at that point. But this is when I started getting serious about my therapy. So from there, um, my therapist was like, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? Because if you're planning to spend more time with this person, especially in the pandemic, then you need to be honest. They deserve to know, you know, what they're getting into as in if you need help where you're having like an episode, they need to know exactly what to do in that case, because it can be dangerous for both of you. If you're having an episode and you and they don't know what's happening, they don't know what's going on with you. So looking at it, and also my therapist at that time was very blunt. So, and that's the only way I can operate when knowing, because I will talk myself out of things like, I ah, know I should be good, you know? <laughs> so like, um, like you were saying uh, that you go on walks every day. I'm like, oh yeah, I should go on a walk. Ah well, it's kind of hot out. It's like 80 degrees. Never mind. It's good. We're good. <laughs> um, so yeah. So from there, I was very scared, very nervous, but I told them, I told my partner and they took it actually very well. Um, they did their research on different things that could happen with someone who's experiencing bipolar type two. So I was very fortunate to have a partner that just kind of did the research and like also like took it upon themselves to look into it. Um, but it was also very kind of refreshing because I've told my part, I've told other partners in the past, but they didn't really take it serious. And when they didn't take it serious, I didn't take it serious. So we all kind of just enabled it a little bit. And when I was depressed, it was kind of like my it was kind of like that time of the month type of deal where like everybody kind of just stayed away from me and I kind of just dealt with it on my own. Um, but now that I was able to be honest with my relationship and everything, I feel like it, it's really worked to my benefit because they know when I'm having a low day, they know when I'm having a high day, they know when I am struggling with these voices in that day. So it is hard to deal with, you know, it's a step where, you know, it can be scary to open up to someone, especially if you're just starting to date. But in my opinion, it's worth it because like, I'm able to share so much with them on what I'm going through and we're able to research everything. They go through ADHD. So, you know, we make jokes about it. So like, if I don't do the dishes, I'm like, oh, you know, my voice has gotten in the way, I can't do it. And, you know, and they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that can't fly too long. So, you know, it's, it's fun because it's like, we both go through things and we're able to kind of joke about it and go from there. Not to sound cheesy, but there we go. <laughs> I, I think that's that's awesome. And um, I think if you don't disclose or you don't open up about it, you're hiding a part of yourself, right? Um, and how for how long can you hide that part of yourself? And, you know, with hiding that part of yourself, can you really connect with that person? Like, you're not really going to be able to fully connect um, in that relationship. So thank you so much, Tony, for sharing. Uh, so it is 5.15, and I know I only requested an hour of folks. Um, I know we have a lot of comments. Um, Michelle, thank you for all the comments that you're sharing in the Q&A, and I'll just read one. Um, Michelle says, words are not enough to thank you all for your conversation. Um, sharing, sharing has saved and supported many lives with your resources and life experience. Thanks for normalizing mental health issues. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I will work on um, sending out an email with 
I know a lot of people are looking forward to getting the recording of this. So I um, will do my best. I think I know what I'm doing here on Zoom uh, to save this, this precious cargo and, and share it with you all. Um, and then I will reshare in the chat right now links for Black and Bipolar um, to listen to some of the podcasts, including the one that Amade just shared around relationships. Um, and then, you know, for Depressed While Black, um, please follow them and connect with them. Um, they're both doing amazing work as it relates to um, Black and mental health slash mental illness awareness. Um, so yeah, thank you. And any last thoughts from, from either one of, of you, um, Amade, Tony, any last thoughts, anything you want to share before we sign off? This is not even about like anything mental health, but you guys have been like rocking this chat. I barely got that book link <laughs> into this chat. And I just like, I'm like, what? There's a link here. No, folks, was, so, folks, had like, stuff, folks had stuff to say. And Marty was over here. Listen, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm producing and hosting at the same time. I'm really, this is my first time doing something kind of like this on this level. Uh, but, you know, um, thank you both. And thank you, Amade, for, for helping me with the links. Yes, thank no you. doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm so excited. Excited. Like, I got you. You want that podcast? <laughs> yeah, I got you. I'm like, dang, girl. Okay. My keyboard is... I see. I'm like, dang. <laughs> she put my podcast up there? Oh, my God. I got yes. you, <laughs> Yes, seriously, seriously. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's just, you know, a matter of all of us being so excited to be able to share that information um, and to help. And um, hopefully you caught it, but if you didn't catch it, I'm going to be sending out an email that kind of has all the stuff listed out. What do you, what do you have coming up, Tony? Any, anything coming up? I know you, you're doing the podcast. Anything we should look out for coming up? Um, and my new episode comes out next Wednesday. Um, and then from there, I actually have a um, panel that I'm going to be, or actually just a podcast I'm going to be on where it is talk about, talk about it. Um, so you'll be seeing flyers about that. Um, as of right now, because we've been really busy with some guests, um, it's really just been the episodes and uh trying to trying to figure out different things that we can do around the city that can help young individuals get the resources that they want but um right now it's kind of slow taking but we're working with some other companies to help with that awesome and amade how about you anything coming up for you i know yeah. you got a lot going on so yes <laughs> don't be shy yeah. Yeah, we were doing a fat fundraiser uh, so that we can help folks who are formerly incarcerated uh, connect with a therapist of color. Uh, so if you go to bit.ly slash, yeah, bit slash rebuild 2021, um, definitely appreciate that. Uh, so yeah. Anything else um, going on? I know you're doing, I know that's a big part of what you're doing, but I thought I saw something else. So maybe it already passed. Um, the panel that you were on, it already passed? Oh panels. my gosh, yes. Yeah, I've been on panels. This is actually my second speaking gig today. So yeah, oh, just wow. been a bunch, but it's it's great. Su I mean, it's Suicide Prevention Month. This is like my Christmas, you know what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We got to talk about it. We go in. Suicide Prevention Month and um, Minority Mental Health Month and regular, listen, that's the time where we're like, okay, Let's roll up our sleeves, people. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll wait for you to um, drop the link in. And um, I know people are exiting. Um, so thank you guys for taking the time out on a Friday to come and join us. I know you could be anywhere else, but you decided to hang out with three Black girls talking about suicide and mental health and mental illness and all that great stuff. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.